he would wear a tie tucked into his shirt, a white shirt, even when he would work on his car in the garage, because that was what was culturally expected of him in the community. So I understand that as an adult now. But as a kid, I was just embarrassed. And I had no clue what tucking my shirt in had to do with worshiping God, which is what I thought I was there to do that day. I thought it looked pretty good. What do we call it when, when we step beyond what God's Word actually says about His standards, and when we expect other people to live up to our standards, or when we expect other people to adhere to our preferences in style. There's a word for that. What do we call it? Legalism. Legalism. Right? That's what it's called. It's called legalism. And even in a church like ours, where we preach the gospel is Jesus plus nothing, where we preach that salvation is not gained through works, but by God's grace through faith in Christ alone, there's a tension. I don't care what church you're in. There is a tension that exists with the question, now what? Now that I'm a Christian, how do I live for God? How do we do that? Do I tuck my shirt in? Is, is, is that what a good Christian looks like? Do I need to be at church every time the doors are open? Is, is that what a good Christian looks like? Do I need to quit my job and move to Haiti? Is, is that what a good Christian looks like? Is that how I am supposed to live for God? This morning we're going to take a look at what I'm going to call a recovering legalist. This man had experienced the power of God's grace in his life in a very powerful way, a very meaningful and significant way. And he really believed that salvation is by God's grace through faith in Jesus plus nothing. He believed that, but this tension still existed within him. He still struggled with this question, now what? Now that I'm a Christian, how do I live for God? Open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. Just a reminder, make sure you bring your Bible every week. You will be able to follow along a lot easier if you have your Bible. How many of you, uh, just curious, raise your hand, if you have been able to sit down, we've been at this six weeks now, at least once over the past six weeks, sit down and read the whole letter of Galatians from beginning to end in one sitting. Right? How many of you? All right, good, good. Keep that up. If you haven't had a chance to do it yet, it's the first time you're here with us today. Uh, we're just encouraging you. Something to take you 15 minutes, 20 minutes if you're a slower reader like I am. Sit down and read from chapter 1 all the way through in one sitting. It'll really help you uh, each week if you'll do that. In chapter 2, what we're seeing is, is Paul here, he's writing this letter to the churches, to the believers in this region of Galatia. And what we have to always remember when we're, when we're reading through this letter is that this church, these churches in Galatia, have a mixture of people in them. Some come from a Jewish background. Some come from a Gentile background. And up until Christianity began, these two groups did not mix together. And now, because of Christ, Jewish background people, the Gentile background people, now they're all in the same church worshiping together. Now they're all trying to figure out how to live for God together. And what we're seeing here uh, in, in our text last week and even into today is this tension that exists with legalism. This tension that exists with the question, now what, how do I live for God? And they were experiencing this tension, and it was threatening to destroy their unity. It was threatening to, to hinder the gospel. Let's go to verses 11 to 13. Let's start with that. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him. This is Paul talking, right? The Apostle Paul. I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. What did he do? Verse 12 says, before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. 
But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So what we're seeing here, sometime after the, the council that took place in Jerusalem, we looked at that in Acts 15, Peter comes from Jerusalem to Antioch, and we're not told why he came, but when he first gets there, it says here that he enjoys fellowship with all the believers. He sat down and ate meals together with the Gentiles. Now here's what that means. That might not mean a lot to you right now. But in that culture, in that day, what that meant was that Peter accepted his Gentile brothers and sisters in Christ as equal. Something a little closer to home maybe would be if, uh, if you were to go uh, south into a diner during the years of segregation in this country, and you were to sit down and have a meal with a person of black skin, you would, by doing that, show everyone and that person that you accept them. Right? That's what that would have meant during those, those years. It says here that these men, after Peter gets there, he's enjoying fellowship with all the believers, and then these men come from James. Now, I find that fascinating. It doesn't say, Paul doesn't say these men came from Jerusalem, which is where they physically came from. That's the location they came from. He says they came from James. Now, why did he say they came from James? What do we know about James? We know that James was the brother, or technically half-brother, of Jesus. We know that he's a Christian. We know that he is uh, he, he's a, a, a man who is very passionate about his Jewish tradition. He's a man that is very passionate about his Jewish culture. That's very, very important to James. So it's possible. It's possible that that James sends these guys up to Antioch to maybe check on Peter. Make sure Peter isn't eating bacon and eggs, right? Make sure his shirt tucked in. Make sure he's not preaching from the NIV or something crazy like that, right? It's possible that that's what's going on. It's possible that James might have been struggling with legalism. We're not told that. Here's what we know. We know for sure that these group of men that came from Jerusalem, according to Paul from James, they were of the circumcision group. The circumcision group taught and believed that Gentile believers needed to be circumcised and follow the Jewish traditions. That's what they believed. And they show up, and Peter gets all nervous. Peter is intimidated by these men. He doesn't want them to think poorly of him. So Peter stops eating with the Gentiles. He segregates himself from them. Imagine, there's Peter. After church one day, one of the Gentile believers that he's been hanging out with for some time. And they come up and say, hey Peter, you want to come over tonight for some ham pot pie? No, sorry, I can't, I can't do that tonight. Why, you got something else going on? No, I just, I just can't. They could catch the vibe of what was happening, right? Can you imagine they would be hurt? Well, you think, at first, when you first read that, you think, well, is it really that big of a deal? Is it, is it really that bad? I mean, here, here, Peter's got these friends. They show up from Jerusalem. He just wanted to hang out with them, right? He, he just wanted to spend some time with them. Well, that can't be the case because Paul gets, gets pretty excited. He gets, he gets pretty passionate about Peter being wrong. He gets in his face, right? He gets right up in his face. And, and he calls him a hypocrite. That's a strong word. Think of it in these terms. Let's say that you are a really popular kid in your school. And uh, you, you take it very seriously. Uh, you you want to make sure that uh, you're, you're never seen talking to the wrong people. Right? You take your image and your popularity are very important to you. And you want to make sure that uh, you're not seen talking to, to someone who would uh, do damage to your image. And then you become a Christian. And as a, as a new Christian, you start to read the Bible, and, and as you're reading through your Bible, you, you come across things, 
And you start to learn things like, love your enemy. You start to learn things in the Bible like, do not show favoritism. You start to learn things in the Bible like, stand up for the weak. And as you're growing in your faith, the Holy Spirit convicts your heart that you've not been treating people the way you should be treating them. And, and so you make a decision. You make a decision that you're going to uh, sit and have lunch with someone that normally you would never be caught dead talking to. Because you believe it's the right thing to do. And so that's what you do. You make a new friend, you sit down, you have lunch with them, and this goes on for a while, and then the semester ends. And a new semester begins. And now all of your popular friends are eating the same lunch period as you and your new friend, and now you've got a choice to make. And a decision you make is, I don't want my popular friends to make fun of me. I don't want them to be offended that I'm talking to this, this goofy kid. I don't, I don't want my reputation to be tarnished, and so you back away. Now, it's not an exact parallel. It's not a perfect parallel, but you get the idea. What Peter was doing was wrong. He was in the wrong. Peter let fear capture his freedom in Christ. He was afraid of what these legalistic men would think of him for not sticking to tradition. And to make matters worse, Peter's example then filters out to the other Jewish Christians in the church, and they start to do the same thing. In fact, it got so bad that even Barnabas... Now, what do we know about Barnabas? His name means encourager. This is a guy that loves people. Barnabas is a spiritual leader in the church at Antioch, and even Barnabas got sucked into it. Listen to me. If Barnabas can get sucked into legalism, any of us can get sucked into legalism. We have to be very, very careful about that. It can happen quickly. It's not, and, and, and it's like Peter, he, he knew the gospel, he, he just wasn't living it. He was really struggling to answer this question, now what? Now that I'm a Christian, how do I live for God? Well, look what happens next. Let's go to verse 14. All right, so when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of all of them, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Paul's saying, listen, Peter, you are a Jew by nationality. And yet you're living like a Gentile. You're going to church, not to synagogue. You, you aren't sacrificing animals anymore. You worship Jesus as God. You are living your life like a Gentile Christian, and yet you are expecting these Gentiles to follow Jewish tradition and to become a Jew. You're being a hypocrite. And you notice how he even attaches this to the truth of the gospel. He says, you guys aren't living out the gospel. Here's what he meant by that. By demanding that the, the Gentile follow Jewish tradition in order to be accepted as a brother or sister in Christ. What you're really saying is the Gentile has to become a Jew to be a Christian. And that is taking the gospel and adding something to it. Right? That's not Jesus plus nothing. It's not the gospel. If you think of it like this, America used to be thought of as a Christian nation in the sense that uh, Christian values oftentimes represented our national identity. Now, I think that would be a harder case to make today. Right? But let's imagine for the, for the sake of this illustration that, that being a Christian and, and being an American still have some, uh, some connecting points as far as the value structure. Right? Let's, let's, let's assume that. So it's Sunday morning. We're all gathered together for worship. Our shirts are all tucked in. We all look very nice. And in walks Paco from Mexico. He doesn't even know.
know what the 4th of July is. He doesn't know about our culture. He doesn't know about our values. He doesn't know that that kind of thing is important to us. The guy's wearing a sombrero. He's never even been deer hunting. Can you imagine that, Jimmy? <laughs> Paco eats tacos on Easter instead of ham. Who does that? His shirt's on top. and doesn't even own a tie. And his English is horrible. But Paco walks in and he says that he loves Jesus. Actually, he says, Me llamo Paco y me ama Jesús. I took some Spanish in college. For 11 years. Now, Paco decides that he wants to learn English so that he can have better relationship with us, so that he can have better fellowship with us. So he really works on his English. But does Paco need to learn English in order to become a Christian, in order to be saved? Yes or no? Does Paco have to eat ham and shoot off bottle rockets in order to be accepted by us as a brother in Christ? No. Does Paco have to get rid of that silly soccer jersey that says Mexico on it and go to Walmart for crying out loud and buy a Steelers jersey, or after I learned last week, a Cowboys jersey apparently? <laughs> Does he have to do something like that to really prove that he loves Jesus. I mean, if he loves Jesus, well, surely he'll have a Steelers jersey. <laughs> Let's find out what Paul's answer to that is. Go to verse 15. It says, We who are Jews by birth, I love this, it's in quotes here. He says, Not Gentile sinners. You can almost feel the mood in what he's saying there. You think you're so much better because you were born a Jew. Is that your attitude? Is that, is that what you're trying to say, Peter? Because that's the vibe you're giving off. Know this, he says in verse 16. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by what? Faith. By faith in who? In Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by what? By faith in who? In Christ. Not by observing the law. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that, that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I prove that I am a lawbreaker. Paul says... No, we are justified by faith in Jesus, not by our tradition. Now, some of you might not be as familiar with the term justification or justified, so I want you to write the word down. Write the word justification down, or the word justified. I'll give you some uh, definitions to, to kind of fill in your understanding of that. First of all, you need to know that justification is a legal term. If, if someone were to break into your home and you happen to have a weapon and, and you felt as though you, your life was in danger in, in our state, if you shot that person in defense of your life, the law says that is a justifiable homicide. Now, you might have opinions on that. That's still not right or whatever. But the law says that is justified uh, in defense of your life. And the judge would declare that person not guilty of murder. So it's a legal term. There is no such thing as justifiable gossip. There's no such thing as justifiable adultery. There's no such thing as justifiable pride or justifiable selfishness. We are guilty of these things when we break the law. And Paul says, keeping tradition is not going to justify your sin. We are only justified, here's the definition you want to write in, ready? Declared spiritually innocent. That's what justified means, in a biblical sense. 
We are only declared spiritually innocent by God, who is the righteous judge. I'm not. You're not. We don't get to declare ourselves spiritually innocent. Only God can do that. And He does that when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. Here's what happens. The very moment you trust Christ as your forgiver of sin, your Savior from hell, Jesus applies His righteousness to your account. God drops the gavel and declares you spiritually innocent. Not because you deserve it, but because the righteousness of Christ has been applied to your account. That's justification. What did we do to earn such approval? You're right, Gabby. Absolutely nothing. Now, are you ready for this? What do we do to keep God's approval? Ah, see, now there's tension over that question. That's the legalist in us. My son, uh, this is his first year playing baseball with uh, the students. With, with the, uh, the kids are actually doing the pitching. Up until this point, it had been uh, coach, pitch. So this is his first year uh, with the kids pitching. And at the beginning of the season, he was doing, doing very well. He, he was hitting, getting on base most of the time, uh, doing well. Uh, the last few weeks, he's just not hitting the ball. And I can't really see anything particularly wrong with his stance. or I'm not real sure what it is, but he's not getting the ball. And uh, he, he's striking out more than he's, than he's getting on base. Here's my question. Does my son have to hit a baseball to have my approval, to, to earn my approval? Yes or no? I'm, I'm glad you know that of my character. I'm serious. I'm glad you know that that's not true. Does my son lose my approval because he's in a slump in the batter's box? Yes or no? Hit, walk, strike out, or get beamed. He's still my son no matter what. Yes? I want my son to learn how to hit the baseball. I want my son to learn how to scoop his glove, scoop the ball out of the dirt and make a good throw to first. Right? I want him to learn these skills. I want him to enjoy the game of baseball and become a better ball player. So even when he makes mistakes, even when he doesn't get his glove in the dirt and the ball goes between his legs, even when he strikes out, I patiently work with him and encourage him and help him. Because I want him, even through his mistakes, to learn how to become a better one. You see where I'm going with this, guys? This is our relationship with God. My son does not have to perform for me to gain my love and approval. We do not have to perform for God to have His approval. We gain that by His grace through faith in Christ. Now, does God want us to become a stronger and more mature Christian? Absolutely. And even when we mess up, He comes alongside through His Spirit and He says, let's go, let's, let's get this fixed, let's get this cleaned up. Uh, come to me and we'll, we'll work through this and... and and we'll figure this out together. Right? He wants us to become a stronger Christian. You don't have to perform for yourself. You've already got that. Every true Christian in this room is a sinner saved by grace. Nothing more. In fact, we need to own that. We need to have the personal pronoun of that. Uh, we're going to say this together. I am a sinner saved by grace. You ready? I am a sinner saved by grace. Nothing more, nothing less. P. 
Peter had lost sight of this gospel truth. And what he was doing, he was elevating the tradition above the gospel. He was struggling with this question, how do I live for God? Now watch, Paul's about to answer that question for us. Go with me to verse 19. For through the law, I died to the law so that, here we go, so that I might live for God. How do I live for God? Verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, here we go, here's the answer. How do I live for God? I live by what? By faith. In who? I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. How do we live for God? The same way we're made right with God, through faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus to, to send us His Holy Spirit, to live literally inside us and give us the spiritual power we need to live in Him, to give us the spiritual wisdom to be able to understand and rightly apply God's word to our lives. Faith in Jesus to help us learn what it means to live a life of Christian freedom. Now we're going to look at that issue in weeks to come about what Christian freedom is all about. Here's what it's not about. It doesn't mean that we live however we want. Here's what it means. And we'll delve a little deeper in this later. But right now, understand that Christian freedom means that we've got the freedom to live apart from sin's bondage. I don't have to live in bondage to sin anymore. It doesn't have to control my mind. It doesn't have to control my behavior. It doesn't have to control my speech patterns. I've been set free. And the only, the only way I can go back into bondage is if I choose to. Freedom from fear of judgment. Because we know that our sins have been paid for by the blood of Jesus. Freedom from this burden of always trying to feel like we're proving ourselves and never seeming to measure up. Freedom to be who you are in Christ. And not worrying about the expectations of others. So sure, I'm talking talk to him. What's the matter? Be who God's called you to be. You've got a different style than I do? Awesome. That's who God's called you. That's who he's made you to be. Now, we have to live within God's boundaries, right? We need to do that. There's so much room in there to be who God's called you to be. Rick's a great guy. I love Rick. He's my buddy. We don't all have to be like Rick. Right? Walt's a cool dude. He can play the bass. I can't play the bass. Does it make me an uncool Christian or a bad Christian because I can't play the bass like Walt? You're a good guy. I like you. I don't have to be like that. I need to be who God's made me to be. You need to be who God made you to be. Yes? Amen. This is what it looks like to live for God. See, see we study God's Word not to, not to get God to be impressed with us. But so that we can learn who He is, so that we can learn how to live for Him. We live within the boundaries of God's Word, not to impress God, but to stay in, in close personal relationship with Him, to express our love for Him. We get together on Sunday morning, and other times throughout the week we do those things, not to impress God, but to come and worship Him, it's a fellowship. I understand that you can get better preaching at home watching TV. I get that. But you don't get this at home. You will not get this church family who loves you and supports you and prays for you and encourages you and lives life with you. You won't get that on your couch. We put Christian music on in our cars not to impress God. But it's a way that we can keep our minds focused on things that are pure and right and lovely and good and excellent. It's just a, it's a tool to be able to help us. We choose what we wear 
talked or untalked, not to impress God, but to glorify Him in who He has made us unique. He had a special design this creation made. Be who God's called you to be in Christ. So, how are we saved? Through faith in who? Jesus Christ. Hmm? Jesus. And how do we live for God? Through faith in Christ. In Jesus. I wonder if you are ready to put your faith in Jesus this morning, to forgive you of your sin, to rescue your soul. If you're ready for that, we Christians want to encourage you, no matter what you look like or what your background is, we will accept you as our brother and sister in Christ. Because you are a sinner if you'll trust Christ, saved by grace, just like the rest of us. Trying to learn how we can best live for God. We'd love to have you join us on that journey. On the back of your outline, there's a simple explanation. There's lots of smiling Christians in here that love to pray with you. If you get intimidated by crowds, give me a call this week. My number's on the back of the outline. Of your I'll talk to you. Christian, I'm wondering this. Are you ready to let God help you figure out where those legalistic thoughts are in your mind? Sort them out and set them aside. We've all got them. We've all got them. I wonder if we are ready and willing to ask God to help us work through that issue in our lives. If you are, that would be my suggestion this morning. Pray about that. We sing these next two songs as we finish up. Take some time and just pray, God, reveal that to me through your spirit. Those areas in my life, in my mind, in my heart, in which legalism has crept in. And I find myself judging others, not based on God's word, but some standard that I've made up. And help me work through that. Help me set those things aside and accept my brothers and sisters in Christ. And block that. Show them grace and give them room to grow. Father, I do want to thank you for, for your love towards us, and I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for the gospel. The gospel that says that no matter who I am or what I've done or where I've been, or what my family name is, or what my clothes look like, or what, my, what size bank account I have, all those things don't matter to you. The only thing that matters is Jesus. And I just want to thank you for that truth. And I pray that, that, that if there is someone here today that just maybe they've been searching for that kind of acceptance and approval and they haven't been able to find it, God, that they would accept your approval, that they would accept your grace through faith in Christ alone. And I'm asking too, myself first, Lord, that you would forgive us, forgive me, for those legalistic tendencies that creep into our minds and hearts. Reveal them to us by your Spirit and help us to work through it and deal with it. And I thank you for that too, in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. We've got two songs we're going to finish with. And if you have a spiritual need, you want to pray? I'm here.
for your grace that truly is enough. I, I want to thank you for my friend Amanda. I thank you for her courage. I thank you, God, for uh, her desire to receive your grace and, and God, to, to learn how, how to, to live for you. And I pray the same will be true in every one of our hearts as we leave this, pray, this place today that we would have a, a burning desire to, to learn more of what it means to live for you through faith in Jesus plus nothing. Help us to give that truth away to those who need it this week. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great day.